Welcome back to the Der Show. Um, Fox News is reporting that Israel has uh, decided to counterattack Iran. CNN News is reporting that no decision has been made. Um, I have no idea what the reality is. I know what my view is that uh, Israel should counterattack, but its ultimate goal should be regime change, that the only way of achieving peace in the Middle East, and it's a perfect way to achieve peace in the Middle East, is regime change in Iran. And um, yes, it would be complicated, but I had uh, dinner with the Shah of Iran's son on Thursday night. He's the crown prince of Iran. Obviously, he's in exile, but he told me that he thinks 70 to 75 percent of Iranians would approve of a regime change. They hate the mullahs. They hate the um, a theological regime that has been imposed on them, and they would welcome it. We know that all the Sunni Arab states would welcome it. Saudi Arabia would welcome a change of regime. Um, uh, the Gulf states would welcome a change of regime. Jordan would welcome a change of regime. Egypt would welcome a change of regime. Obviously, Israel and the United States would. Um, some of Lebanon would, some of Lebanon wouldn't. North of Lebanon, yes. South Lebanon, which is under the control of Hezbollah. No. Um, so whatever actions Israel takes uh, should be designed to do two things. Um, one, it should be designed to uh, knock out is the, the nuclear um, uh, weaponry that Hamas, uh, that Iran has. And second, it should be the first step in regime change. We're going to get to that. That's the subject of the whole show and whether the Biden administration is doing the wrong thing. It is. Um, by imposing uh, constraints on on Israel. I'm going to get to that, but there are two other items, <laughs> obviously, in the news, one related, one unrelated. Related is that all these coordinated demonstrations, which are obviously con coordinated by either the Muslim Brotherhood or some uh, rapidly anti-Israel group, are now being conducted uh, blocking bridges um, uh, the Golden State Bridge was blocked for four hours. People may have been hurt as the result of not being able to get to medical care, whatever. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge was 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 blocked. Wall Street was blocked. Um, Chicago, the O'Hare Airport, uh, was blocked. You know, those who think that January 6th was an insurrection, you know, have to wonder whether or not preventing people from living their lives in a coordinated effort to try to change policy um, is an insurrection, especially when some of the people participating in protests are screaming death to America and, and, and chanting death to America, both in English and in Arabic. In Chicago, over the weekend, people were chanting death to uh, America, death to Israel. Uh, scratch an anti-Israel, scratch an anti-Semite. You're going to find an anti-American. You don't have to scratch that deep. You're going to find an anti-American. And so... Uh, I think this coordinated effort to protest Israel probably was arranged weeks ago, and it was designated today. And from the point of view of the protesters, you couldn't have picked a worse day because many Americans feel uh, sympathetic to it, Israel after 300 rockets were fired. Now, the protesters claim they're peaceniks. <laughs> Just what nonsense, what lies. They're warmongers. Uh, these same protesters who are saying, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire against Israel, are many of them applauding Iran sending 300 missiles to civilian areas. The missiles were shot down over Jerusalem, over the Aqsa Mosque, over other areas that are population centers. So Iran is trying to kill civilians, and they're being cheered on by these peaceniks who are protesting Israel trying to destroy terrorists in Hamas. What incredible hypocrisy. And these little Hitler youth are marching along with them. Look, as I've said before, there are three groups of people who are involved in these protests. There are the old-fashioned communist um, anarchists who will use any occasion to try to bring down America. Uh, they date back to the Vietnam period. They date back to the Chicago Convention of the Democratic Party in 1968. Um, Occupy Wall Street. They'll do anything to bring down America. Any excuse. Israel's an excuse. They don't care about the Palestinians. They couldn't care less. This is just another excuse to bring down America. That's group one. Group two are Muslim um, and Arab people who will never be satisfied as long as there is an Israel 
even on a sliver of land, you know, the size of Central Park. Um, they just want the end of Israel. And then there are the, the Hitler youth, uh, the, the, the stupid kids, some of my students, some of my friends and relatives, uh, grandchildren and children, um, who will march with anybody um, as long as they're anti-American and hard left and anti-Trump and anti-Jewish. you know Jewish, They'll march with anybody. So there are these three groups, all of which are anti-American. And that shows up so clearly today with these orchestrated stoppings of traffic uh, all, over, all over the country, a coordinated effort. I hope the FBI looks into it. Protests are okay. Uh, people can hold signs. Blocking traffic is not constitutionally protected. Uh, it's not legal. It's a crime. And so let's see if there is any any prosecution. Speaking of prosecutions, I have to say a word about the, the Trump case. This Trump case is such a disaster, this attempt to try to prevent Trump from campaigning. The only purpose of bringing this trial, it's there's no crime. There's no crime. It's a made up case. There's a misdemeanor failing or mis, misstating uh, payments on a corporate form. The statute of limitations on that expired years ago. Uh, in order to create a felony out of it and bring it within the statute of limitations, they have to allege that the reason that he paid hush money was to influence the election. That was the only reason. It wasn't to try to prevent his wife from being embarrassed or his children from being embarrassed. No, no, that played no role at all, because according to the head of the former head of the Federal Election Commission, in order to bring a, a federal election case, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the only purpose was to impact the election. He gave a few examples of um, somebody goes is going to be on television and uh, buys the two thousand dollar suit, which he's never bought before in order to help his election prospects. That's not an election contribution because he has the suit. Um, and he gave other examples like that. And this is clearly something that fits within those examples. But uh, they're trying to prosecute. The only purpose is to try to keep him out of Pennsylvania. Biden's in Pennsylvania in the next few days. Trump should be in Pennsylvania. There should be an election and a campaign from both sides, not from one side. And the judge completely misunderstands the Constitution. The Constitution gives a defendant the right to be at the trial. It doesn't give the state the right to compel him to be at the trial. He can waive the right to be at the trial. And it's been done over and over and over again. Defendants have waived the right to be at the trial. There's a famous case uh, some years ago, way, way back uh, during the Jim Crow era, where the defendant was a black man who was accused of raping a white woman. And the defense attorney very cleverly uh, uh, got permission from the judge to keep the defendant out of the courtroom so that the jury wouldn't know that he was black. Because if the jury didn't know if he was black, they're not going to convict a white, he was 19 or 20 years old, they're not going to convict an 18 or 19-year-old white guy uh, who had sex with a 17-year-old uh, white girl of, of statutory rape. But if the defendant were black, of course they would. And so in order to prevent a racial verdict, the defendant waived his right to be a trial and the court granted it and he was acquitted. Um, a defendant doesn't have to be in the courtroom. Uh, he has to be there for sentencing, obviously. He has to be there for the verdict, but he doesn't have to be there for the whole trial. Um, and, and to make him be there for the trial is unconstitutional when he has a First Amendment right to be out there campaigning to be the president of the United States. You know, as I've said before, I have a constitutional right to vote against them for the third time and a constitutional right to see that this is a fair election and that if he loses, he loses fair and square without the thumb, or in this case, the elbow of Democratic politician uh, prosecutors uh, on the scale of justice. And so um, he has the right not to be there. And I hope his lawyers will bring a case. Uh, they could get it up to the Supreme Court pretty quickly, I think, saying that if the defendant wants to miss the trial, he can. I mean, he wants to go to his son's graduation. He wants to go to the Supreme Court to listen to the argument as to whether he has immunity. No, 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 no we're not going to let you do that. Uh, the, the judge has it on backwards. 
um, if they try to keep him out of the courtroom, that would be a violation of his constitutional right. But if he decides to waive his constitutional right, in general, the Constitution permits him to do so. Now, there may be this New York regulation or New York rule which requires him to be there. That's unconstitutional. If it de denies him his First Amendment right to be out campaigning for president. So I hope his lawyers will will raise that issue. It's the worst, weakest case I've seen in 60 years of teaching, writing, practicing criminal law, and yet it might be result in a conviction because of the judge in the case, because of the jurors in the case, and because of the prosecution in the case. What a scandal. What a scandal. So now let's turn to um, the Biden, the Biden administration. Let's be fair. The Biden administration did a very, very good thing, and I commend them for it for putting together a coalition, including Great Britain, maybe France, I'm not sure, um, uh, Jordan, uh, to help shoot down the 320 or so missiles, some drones, some uh, scuds, some uh, missiles. Missiles are supersonic. They can go very, very, very fast. Um, and it needed very sophisticated uh, technology to knock them down. Now, there's a, a rumor going around. It's total nonsense. Oh, that Iran purposely warned Israel in advance because they didn't really want to hurt anybody. They just wanted to satisfy their their own constituency that they were going to fight back against the completely lawful killing by Israel of high-ranking generals, one of whom at least had been involved in preparing the September the uh, sorry October seventh uh, massacre uh, in in Israel, according to reports. So Israel had a perfect perfect right to kill these generals, no matter where they were. And they weren't in any diplomatic place. They were in an annex building that was disguised as a consulate building. It wasn't. It was a military building used to house uh, military terrorist operatives. So, so Iran, Israel had a perfect right to destroy the building, and Iran had no right to uh, attack Israel and declare war on Israel. That's what they did. They declared war on Israel. As a result of that, Israel now has the perfect right to respond disproportionately, yes, that's what I said, disproportionately, people misunderstand what proportionality means. If you attack the United States, if a country attacks the United States and kills one person, or even fails to kill one person, just sends a bomb to the United States, the United States can respond by destroying the entire military of that country. There is no rule of proportionality applicable to a military response to a military attack. The only rule of proportionality is this. If you're attacking a target, that involves the possible killing of civilians, real civilians, not Gaza civilians, real civilians, then you have an obligation to make sure that the military value of the target is proportional to the number of civilian deaths that you're likely to achieve. So for example, if there's one terrorist and he's hiding in a hospital with a thousand innocent patients or babies. You can't attack that terrorist because you're gonna kill lots of innocent babies to get one terrorist. On the other hand, if Iran buries its nuclear arsenal underneath a hospital with 10,000 babies, the rule of proportionality is you can bomb the hospital. You can kill any number of innocent people to prevent Iran from being able to use nuclear weapons against you if you're Israel, the United States, or any other country. That's the rule of proportionality. And so it has no application to if Israel wants to bomb military targets, oil reserves, uh, technology headquarters, um, uh, air defense systems, all of that. They can destroy every aspect of Iran's military capability in response to the 300 and so missiles that were sent to Israel. They're gonna do it? No, they're not gonna do it. My point is this, there has to be a purpose and a goal to Israel's response. First, it has to restore its deterrence, that's true. It has to tell Iran, if you ever send another missile, we're gonna destroy a lot of things and, 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 and you better not do it. That's deterrence, that's one thing. The other thing is it should begin the process of regime change. It should weaken the regime enough so that the 70, 75% of the people who want to see regime change in Iran will get the power to do so. Uh, right now, of course, they don't have the power to do so because the 
the Iranian regime is so ruthless that they kill any dissenter. They throw them off the roofs. They hang them from uh, in the middle of the square uh, from cranes. Uh, so it's been very hard for the 75 percent or 70 percent, whatever it is, to marshal opposition to the regime. But the, but they could do it. And 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 I think destroying uh, Iran's potential for developing nuclear weapons, nuclear arsenal, which they're very close to, uh, is a is a desirable and completely lawful response. And let me give you an analogy from history. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard this before. In the middle of the 1930s, Goebbels wrote in his diary, uh, or he wrote about it in his diary. Uh, maybe a little later, he died. In in 45, you know, how Goebbels died. He killed his whole family and then he committed suicide because he thought the Jews would go after his family. Of course, they never went after anybody who wasn't themselves guilty. But uh, Goebbels wrote that uh, he was sure in 1934, 1935, that Great Britain and France, uh, when they saw that Germany was building its great military power in violation of the Versailles Treaty, that they would attack. And he was shocked that they didn't attack. If they had attacked and destroyed the Nazi regime in 34 and 35, they would have saved 50 million lives. But they didn't do it because they were afraid that if they attacked the regime, it would widen the war. It would bring other countries into it. And that's what that's what Biden is foolishly, foolishly concerned about, not widening the war. No, you should widen the war and go after Iran's nuclear capacity and go after Iran's regime. That would bring about peace. Imagine what would happen if the regime changed and if the Shah's son or some other person would take over and democratize Iran and turn it into the kind of democracy it could be because it has such brilliant, brilliant people. Prime Minister Netanyahu today was on television saying how much of Silicon Valley today is run by people of Iranian background who had to leave the country. And he was hoping for a day when Iran and Israel could create a Silicon Valley in the Middle East uh, using the brilliance of Iranian scientists and Israeli scientists together. But no, it's not, it's not going to happen. And so uh, it's, it's, it's important. If the, if, if, if the Iranian regime, the Mullah's regime, is overruled and, and changed and defeated the way the Nazis could have been defeated in 1934 and 1935, there will be peace in the Middle East. Hamas would disappear. Hezbollah would disappear. The Houthis would disappear. They can't operate without support from Iran. Every Sunni country in the Middle East would be happy. Uh, Israel and the Palestinians could at that point think about making some kind of a rapprochement or rapprochement at a peace. There wouldn't be the threat of an Iranian nuclear attack, and, and Israel could be more confident in its ability to make peace with the Palestinians. It would be win, 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 not just win, win, but win, 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 win. But does the Biden administration have the courage to do it? The answer is no, they don't. They don't have the courage to do it. They're terrified about widening the war. Sometimes widening the war is the right thing thing to do. It would have been the right thing to do in 1934, 1935 in Germany. It was the wrong thing to be Chamberlain. It was the right thing to be Winston Churchill. And the question is, is Joe Biden going to be Chamberlain? Apparently, yes. Or is he going to be Winston Churchill? Apparently, no. And who's gone down in history as a great man? Winston Churchill, not Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain is famous for coming back off his little airplane with his hat and his umbrella saying, we have achieved peace in our time. Peace in our time. 50 million people died, including 6 million Jews and tens of thousands of, of British soldiers uh, and British civilians who would have lived if not for Chamberlain's absurd decision not to attack Nazi Germany in 1934 and 1935. Biden is going to go down in history as Chamberlain. If he doesn't understand, this is the moment. This is the opportunity. It's legal. It's moral. Iran provided the opportunity by attacking Israel with 300 and some odd missiles. Now Israel has the right, with or without American support, to respond 
and to respond disproportionately and to send a message to every country, do not attack Israel. If you do, you will be destroyed. Send the same message to Hezbollah in Lebanon. That message is being sent to Hamas in Gaza over the objection of all these people who are blocking highways and who don't care at all about Palestinian rights. What they care about is hating America and hating Israel. So this is a very important moment in history. Uh, 50 and 100 years from now, we'll be looking back at this moment the way we look back now at the horrible decision by Chamberlain and his predecessors not to destroy the Nazi regime when it could have. This Iran is the new Nazis. They are exactly the same as the old Nazis. They would, if they could, create gas chambers and, 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 and crematoria and kill the Jews already. They're killing gays, yet you have gays for Gaza, gays for Gaza, gays for Hamas, which means gays for Iran. And that's just so self-defeating. But people care so much. Anti-Semitism is so deep and so, so much of a rot in the heart and souls of people that there are some gay people who would sacrifice the rights of gay people in order to hurt Jewish people, in order to destroy Israel. I have to tell you, I support gay rights. I will no longer contribute to any gay organization, any gay organization or any other organization that supports Hamas, doesn't support Israel, and doesn't support America. My love for America and Israel transcends uh, my interest in supporting the rights of people, whether they're gay or straight, who are willing to um, see uh, terrorism prevail. And it's so self-defeating because any gay person who goes to Gaza is going to be thrown off a roof. Any gay person who goes to Iran is going to be thrown off a roof or hanged from from a crane how can these people support how can these people it's just that they hate america so much they hate jews so much they hate israel so much they hate western democracy so much what do they want they want a caliphate where they'll be murdered i mean it's insanity and yet we see it we see it all over uh we see it among a lot of college uh, students these hitler youth and 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 yeah hitler youth Student asked me at Cardozo, are you comparing us to Hitler Youth? Yes, I am. When you support Hamas, when you support Hezbollah, when you support Iran, when you support from the river to the sea, which means the end of Israel, yes, I, I do analogize you to Nazi youth. And, and just because you're 23 years old doesn't excuse you. 23-year-olds brought Hitler to power at the University of Munich. They brought Stalin to power. They brought Castro to power. You are responsible for your actions, and you will be held accountable by history for your actions. You will be held responsible also by future employers for your action. And we're not going to let you hide your names. If you're hiding behind masks with signs, death to America, death to Israel, we're going to find out who you are. It's not McCarthyism. That's called accountability, holding you responsible. And I'm perfectly comfortable revealing the names of people who espouse these kinds of racist uh, and anti-American uh, slogans. And so, yeah, uh, we'll see what happens. By the end of the show, probably we'll know uh, whether Israel has or has not decided to respond. My prediction is they will respond militarily, but not to the extent that they should, uh, because they'll be pressured by the Biden administration with threats of cutting off arms. Already the Biden administration said it wouldn't help in any way, any aggressive actions. Why not? Why wouldn't the Biden administration help Israel retaliate for this attack on its sovereignty? It should do that, and uh, but it won't. And so we'll see. By tomorrow's show, we'll probably have a much better sense of where we're going in this very, very uh, serious, historic time. We will look back at this moment in history and say, what an opportunity was missed and how many people had to die because of the cowardice of uh, the American administration and not standing up to uh, tyranny and terrorism. All right, let me look at some letters. <laughs> well, now can you tell us if OJ really did it? Inquiring minds want to know. Well, you're going to have to keep inquiring. You know the story. I think I've said it before. When Netanyahu first got elected uh, prime minister, he invited me and my wife and my daughter to the office. And uh, he took me aside and said, I need to ask you a very secret question. Take 
took me into his little side room and I thought it would be about Iran or about Palestinians. And he said, did OJ do it? And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, does Israel have nuclear weapons? He said, you know, I can't tell you that. And I said, well, you know, I can't tell you that. I was asked by Pierce Morgan today on the show, uh, on his show, saying, now that OJ's dead, can you tell us what your views are? I said, no. Uh, my views about his innocence or guilt or if he told me anything, and I, that I can say. He never, ever said to anybody he was guilty. He never, ever said that. But uh, you have to take any lawyer client secrets with you to the grave. So, no. You're not going to get me to express my opinion about that. I did in my book. Um, I wrote a book called Reasonable Doubts. And the book, in fact, the cover of the book is interesting. This book is for the many thoughtful observers who sincerely and understandably believe that O.J. Simpson murdered Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman and that the jury's verdict of not guilty was therefore a miscarriage of justice. That's what the book's about. And I demonstrate that without regard to whether O.J. Simpson was guilty or innocent, he didn't get a fair trial, and the jury saw through it. The jury saw the planted evidence, and they acquitted him on that basis. Okay. Next question. Professor Dershowitz comment on the trial of Secretary Mayorkas by the Senate. Very easy. Senator Mayorkas did not commit an impeachable crime. He didn't commit treason. He didn't commit bribery. He didn't commit other crimes and misdemeanors. So the Senate should not even have a trial. It should dismiss the impeachment out of hand by a quick vote. Whether it will do that or not, I don't know. That's what we wanted to happen in the Trump case. It didn't happen. There was a trial. Ultimately, he was acquitted. Uh, so will so will Mayorkas be acquitted. Here's a kind of implicitly anti-Semitic question. Uh, Alan, you believe in the state of Israel? So why don't you go there and live if you believe in it so much? Well, you know, I, I, I believe in Ukraine. I believe in Taiwan. I believe in many countries. Uh, in America, you can believe in, in, a, in, in the right of another country without having to move there. I mean, imagine if somebody said that to a Catholic. You believe in the Vatican? Well, why don't you move there? Uh, or, 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 you know, other countries, uh, you tell a black person, you believe in Africa? Yeah, why don't you move there? Yeah. Why don't you move there is, 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 is always... Uh, uh, a sign of real racism. So, no, I'm not going to respond to that question except in the way I already have. Okay. The biggest issue with jurors is lacking common sense and suppressing evidence due to technicalities. The French system would not exclude unconstitutionally gathered evidence, but it is penalized. More important is the truth. No, I don't agree with you. I think you have to keep out evidence that's improperly obtained. And you can't encourage the police to violate the Constitution. And the United States Supreme Court, not in a unanimous decision, but in a pretty overwhelming decision, Matt versus Ohio, in cases since that time, said that the Constitution does require the exclusion of unconstitutionally obtained evidence. That's, that's the right result. You can have a person who actually did it go free because, as one justice said, the constable bungled, but it's generally not excluded if it's just a bungling. It's excluded if it's deliberate and willful as it was in the O.J. Simpson case. The police deliberately, willfully poured blood from a test tube onto socks in order to create a piece of evidence that would help convict somebody they believed was guilty. The system can't tolerate that because it would lead to the conviction of many innocent people as well. Okay. Professor Dershowitz, if the Biden administration appeases Iran following its direct attack on Israel, would this, would this cross your red line? It's coming close, but... The, the Biden administration did a good thing when Israel was attacked. So, you know, the way I do bananas, I add bananas when they do something wrong and I subtract bananas when they do something right. So Biden administration's, what they did on Saturday night and Sunday adds my credibility. And then what they did today detracts from it. I'm still not up to the red line, but uh, I might be getting there. Uh, Professor, after the IDF has concluded its operation in Gaza against Hamas, do you support Israel sending troops into southern Lebanon to find and eliminate the terror group Hezbollah? But Hezbollah continues to fire rockets. Right now, over 100,000 Israelis can't live in their homes. No country need tolerate that. Can you imagine if uh, a Canadian terrorist group were sending rockets into New York City and everybody had to leave Manhattan? Would we tolerate that? No, of course not. And we shouldn't tolerate that. Okay. 
Uh, last question. I would hope the Trump defense team watches this podcast. You have laid out a perfect set of questions that should be asked. Well, I don't know if they did or not, and I don't know because it's not on television. This is an outrage that this case is not on television. We should be able to see how the justice system operates in America, particularly when a man is running for president is being tried unfairly and the justice system has been corrupted. What are they hiding? I want to see every minute of that trial. I want to see how Judge Marchand handles the case. I want to see how he handles the jury questionnaires. But we can't. We have to listen to CNN and the New York Times. CNN has totally distorted this case, totally distorted this case. If you watch CNN, you think this is the strongest case in modern American history. It's the weakest case, not only in modern American history, but from the July 4th, 1776. But you wouldn't know that from CNN. You wouldn't know that from the New York Times. So keep listening to this podcast. Maybe you'll know it from here. Thanks. See you tomorrow.